Okay, now we're going to talk about what I think is, for many people, one of the most confusing parts of, of trying to think about color. And I've tried to, I've added a bunch of slides this time. We'll see if whether I made it more confusing or more intuitive, I'm not sure. But we're going to talk about color gamuts, um, this color matching problem, and a space called XYZ. And I've tried to make it all come together. So we'll see how it works. You've probably seen pictures like this. There's a chromaticity diagram. So, so it's got this weird horse-shaped curve. It's in, I don't know, some crazy space. Why is it not three-dimensional? Why is it two-dimensional? But we talk about color in this way. And you've probably seen pictures of it like this. And you've probably seen them talking about gamuts. If you buy a monitor or a printer, they frequently will draw this picture of this horseshoe thing and then say, our primaries are these three primaries. And so therefore, this is our gamut. So what's a gamut? Gamut means all the colors that you can produce on this device. So if I have three primaries, if I have a red, green, and blue primary, these things are linear. So if they exist at these points in the world of colors, and I haven't explained what this horseshoe thing is, we're gonna to come to that in a minute, then all the colors my monitor can produce are live inside this triangle. This might be a printer. So some printers have more colors of ink. So printers be, are, might not be just CMYK. They sometimes there can be six ink color printers. There can be printers that have more different kinds of ink. So they can have a different kind of shape here. But again, they're mixing between their primaries. Printers typically have a smaller gamut, meaning they cover a smaller range of colors. And monitors can have a larger gamut of, of colors. So here's an example of an LCD display. It might have a gamut that looks like this. A laser display might have a wider gamut because it can get pure, purer primary colors. Um, and we'll see why in just, in just a minute. But this red triangle represents a larger gamut. Any color I can get on this blue display, I can get on this red display. But this red display can make some colors which are impossible to make on the LCD display. So we talk about gamuts, and we always use this chart. This is always the chart that will be shown in every monitor, printer, whatever, when you want to talk about gamuts. So where does this come from? So what is this X and Y? This is not Euclidean X, Y. These are X and Y in the X, Y, Z color space. So, so what are these components? So first, we need to talk about a color matching experiment. This was done in 1931. It's the basis for modern color science. And the experiment is this. We're going to have three primaries, red, green, and blue. And we're going to shine some laser light. And we're going to ask somebody, please mix. We have, we're going to give them sliders. Please mix these three things until you can get to this color. Like the game I was just showing you, right? Shows you a color, you got to mix until you get to that color. Um, that's the idea. So we're going to play this mixing game. And we're going to record how much. And so if this was a 610 nanometer, and here at 610 nanometer, we're going to say, well, we took a lot of red, we took a little bit of green, and we didn't take any blue. And we were able to match this kind of orangey color. So let's look at an example. So we're trying to match this color here. And then we have um, our three colors that are going to shine here. And if we get this much of each value, we got to this color. Ah, not quite right. Ah, adjust the values. OK, got to this color. Not quite right. OK, adjust the values. Ah, OK, now I got a match. So they basically put humans there to do this matching. This is a human perception question. Nothing about physics. It's about how humans see colors. So here's the three primaries, right? How much fraction of the three primaries we need to get to this color? So this was a pretty straightforward case. So now we're going to consider this case. This color is going to be out of gamma, meaning we cannot get it from these three. So what does that mean? OK, we set our colors, no match. Set our colors again, still no match. We Now we've run primary two all the way down to zero, and I still can't get a match. So what am I going to do? I'm going to put negative of primary two. So I need, ne what, it, what does negative mean? Well, I'm going to add it to the other side until I can get to a match. So if I'm going to add some of this primary on this side, that's equivalent to having negative light on, on this side, something we can't physically have. So we can still get a match. And if we go back to our chart, we'll see that, in fact, the red primary has substantial reasons where we need some negative values. OK, so now here's an animation going through all of these things. So if you take a particular wavelength, this is saying, how much do we need to match to get there? So we, these are our matching colors of our primaries. But during certain points of this curve, I have to add negative light 
in order to be able to get my primary. And the fatness is how much of that I kind of like to lose. Right, so this is just an illustration of where did these curves come from? They came from running an experiment. You go get 100 subjects, you go show them a bunch of colors, and you ask, what do you see? Turn the dials and, and tell you're happy. And then you get some plot that looks like this. And so what are we seeing here? These are our primaries. And this is how much fraction of each of these primaries in order to get to a color that we're trying to see. So what could our primaries be? In this case, they're these laser color lights, red, green, blue. But we could be, we could choose any primary. It doesn't have to be laser light. It, it could be our primary. OK. If we take these RGB as a three-dimensional vector, right? we're going to pack them into a 3D vector, and we plot these three curves together, you get something that looks like this. So this is RGB, and I get this, this curve in three-dimensional space. It's called the spectral locus because we've taken every laser thing and said, what is it in our primaries? So this might be, I don't know which end of the curve is which. This might be 400 nanometer, and then 500 nanometer, and then 600 nanometer, and then 700 nanometer, right? So this is our curve going around in 3D space. Now, if we flatten this curve and only look at the RG components and not the B components, right? And we look at this projected down onto 2D space, we get this horseshoe-shaped curve. So here it is. Here's our horseshoe-shaped curve. Here's our primaries. This is the red axis. This is the green axis. Here's our primary, red. Right is by definition red one and zero and green and blue, right? And green, so no, nothing on the red direction, right? You can think of it as it's just a Euclidean axis, right? So of course it's at this position, zero, one, zero. And then this one is would be off the plane, except it would project it down because it's blue, right? So zero, zero, one, blue. Okay, so this is all the spectral colors and where they come out. And here's the negative portion, right? So remember we needed some negative red to make some colors start to work out. Okay, here's the same plot, same horseshoe plot, now drawn this way. So here's all of our laser spectral values going around. And now, and we had, um, remember these were our three primaries. We had primaries here, here, and here and when we did the actual experiment. But this is annoying because we have to have negative values. And so the question is, could we pick some primaries? Could we do a transformation of our space for which we pick some different primaries such that the whole space was an interpolation of those primaries. So the answer is, if you play math, you, you can. Not in the real world, but if you play math. So we're going to pick these points here. And I'm going to show a different diagram. So here's an RGB space. Here's those same three points. And these are now x, y, z. So we're going to label our new primaries x, y, z. And here's the function that's going to transfer us back and forth. So this matrix times x, y, z gets us to RGB. And of course, the inverse matrix allows us to go the other way. Now, why do we want to do this? Because it drove people crazy that I had to have negative light. They said, I want the primaries where there's no negative light. So they made up this thing in 1931 um, of this x, y, z color space. And now my horseshoe curve is warped over to here, right? Because it went through this matrix transformation. So the same way we have translate rotate scale. Okay, this matrix, what does it do? It takes this shape and turns it into this shape. So here's our x and y, and z is coming out of the plane. Um, so here's our x, y, z place, uh, coordinate system, and here's our curve. Why was this done? Because they had done the color matching experiments, and they hated the negative, and they wanted to get rid of it. So they made up a new space. So that's x, y, z. And this is the space that we show this horseshoe curve in. And that's how you get to this chromaticity diagram. So now, do you need to do any calculations in XYZ? No. But where the heck does this diagram come from? It comes from this process I told you to that gets you to this. And why do we use this chromaticity diagram? To talk about gamuts and, and which colors we can show. Uh, I want to scroll back. I wish I had put it at the end also. OK, so when I talk about these gamuts, there's another thing that I, I should have said here. So I have these colors. As my, as my real world primaries that I can achieve, right? Remember my fake imaginary primaries are over in these, these other positions. So these are imaginary primaries um, that can't exist in the real world. These real world ones, there's laser color values that lie out here. So this is a color I can see, but it doesn't lie in my gamut. So it means the real world can contain colors that we can't show 
on any three color monitor, right? There's no three points I can pick. Uh, even if I use the most ideal colors, because the stuff that really exists in the world is inside this curve. So for, as far as our human perception is concerned. So any three colors I pick, I cannot get this whole curve. So any three color monitor is gonna have stuff missing from the, from the real world. Um, and most are about this size. So there's a lot of stuff missing that we can see in the, the real world that we don't see on our monitors. Now, why don't we care? Well, I can't show it on a monitor, so I can't really show you, but I have some green stuff that's inside my, my, my curve, right? I have some green. This is a, what, what does this really look like if I could see the real thing? This is a, a laser green, right? So if you look at a green laser, you know, it's a, it's a brightness, it's a something that you don't really see on a real monitor. Um, and of course, I can't show it to you here on, on your real monitor. So there is stuff out here that, that we don't get. 